Hello, and welcome once again to Holy Trinity in Launceston. I'm Dane Courtney, the Rector of Holy Trinity. We trust you've been finding some benefit from these online services, and a special welcome This is if, if this is your first time with us. We're very pleased to have you here, and we hope you will join us in prayer and in hearing God's word. With me today are our organist, Peter Schultz, as well as our Bible readers, Irina and Chris. We'll be following the first part of the Order for Holy Communion from a prayer book for Australia. Some of the words will appear on screen as we go. The readings are those for the fifth Sunday of Easter. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. I am the way and the truth and the life, says the Lord. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Ever-living God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments and to share his risen life, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today the first Bible reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 7. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, and dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their cords at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 31. To you, Lord, have I come for shelter. Let me never be put to shame. O deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me and be swift to save me. Be for me a rock of refuge, a fortress to defend me. For you are my high rock and my stronghold. Lead me and guide me for your name's sake. Bring me out of the net that they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord God of truth. All my days 
are in your hand. O oh, deliver me from the power of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face to shine upon your servant and save me for your mercy's sake. Our second Bible reading is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sin sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority or to governors, who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he trusted, entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks be to be God.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? We thank you again, Lord, for your word. Help us to hear, to understand, and to make this part of our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The good life. What comes to mind when you hear that expression? The good life. It was the name of a popular sitcom in the late 1970s. There's a book of that name by Australian social researcher Hugh McKay, or even a cookbook with the same name. Not to mention a holiday rental in Borley Point, New South Wales, a B&B &B in Perth, Western Australia, and an ethical farm in Victoria's Macedon Ranges. And they're just a sample. In truth, it's a question that men and women have sought answers to for millennia. What is the good life? What does it mean to live a good life? The heart of today's passage from Peter's first letter is his urging his readers to live good lives. Indeed, such good lives that those around may see your good deeds and glorify God. We'll come to that in a moment. But first, a quick recap on where we've come to in this letter so far. Peter, a prominent member of Jesus' disciples and now a leader of the church, is putting pen to paper somewhere in the early 60s, so around 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. His readers, whom he calls exiles and foreigners, live in a variety of places, but most of them around the area we know today as Turkey. And they came from both Jewish and non-Jewish backgrounds. Yet these are all people, as are we, his later readers also, 
that God has chosen to be his in Christ. And he reminds us that our hope flows from the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. Whatever trials may come our way and whatever grief we may suffer for a little while, all serve to refine and prove our faith in Jesus genuine to his praise, glory and honour. He urges us to set our hope consciously on the grace to be brought to us when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. For we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And the flow on is that we should love one another deeply from the heart. Last time we saw how we as believers are being built into a spiritual house or temple and that what had once been true of the physical nation of Israel has transferred across to those who believe in Jesus. The truth that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once, not a people, but now, the people of God. At this point in the letter, Peter turns his attention to the implications of all these things for our lives as believers. And although we've seen some practical application already, it's now expounded at greater length. In today's reading, we find a principle expressed and then three particular examples of how that principle plays out in life. The principle is that we're to live good lives. And the three examples are as citizens, as slaves or servants, for those to whom it applies. And thirdly, as married people, which comes at the beginning of chapter 3, just beyond where we read to. So we start with a closer look at this principle, which has two parts to it, a negative followed by a positive. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. That's the negative. And then, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Notice again Peter's insistence that wherever we happen to find ourselves, we're living in a place that's not our true home. We're foreigners, exiles. Perhaps some of them literally were foreigners, strangers in the places they now lived. But even those of us who've never moved more than a few kilometres from Launceston are still, on Peter's view, foreigners. When we belong to Jesus, our true home is somewhere else. And here, or wherever you may be, we're in a place that will inevitably make life as a believer challenging. Partly that's because we ourselves are not yet made perfect. And so there are still sinful desires that affect us. We're all currently engaged in an effort that's been described as a war on coronavirus. And so many strategies have been put in place to deliberately target it, from hand sanitizer to total lockdown. It's a serious business, and we're determined to win. Peter says, sinful desires wage war on your soul. That is, they're not benign and harmless, but actively working to cause you problems. And so, he says, abstain from them. Which is a little problematic, isn't it? How do you abstain from desires? Surely that's going to be like trying to never again be hungry. What Peter means, of course, is don't entertain them. Don't allow them to get a foothold because they'll drag you down. And I'm sure we all know well enough the effect they can have. 
There's a rather colourful quote from the German reformer Martin Luther who said, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And that's what Peter's intention is here. Now the positive side is that our lives should be so good that they lead people to believe in God and find salvation in Christ. At least that's what I think he intends in verse 12. The leading good lives part is clear enough, but the less clear part is the day God visits us. If Peter means the day of final judgment, then it's not entirely clear how the pagans around us will be glorifying God on that day. But the day God visits us can also mean when he brings salvation. And so I suspect Peter has in mind that our lives will ultimately help lead people to faith. There may be accusations at first, but in the long run, some will be won over. Either way, our lives are to promote the honour of God, which is a huge responsibility when you think about it. So in case we're then left wondering how on earth we might do that, Peter discusses these three particular examples and we'll spend most of our time on the first one, touching just briefly on the other two. Peter calls on his readers to submit willingly and for the Lord's sake to human authority. Many years ago, as some of you know, I was very briefly a high school maths teacher. Jobs were scarce at the time due to an oversupply of teachers, but I ended up with one somewhat unexpectedly in a very prestigious Anglican boys' school in Sydney. I was only there for a year, and it's such a long time ago that it's hard to remember much about it. But one thing I do remember is that this passage from 1 Peter was the school Bible reading, read by the head prefect on every formal occasion, and read from the authorised version in which verse 17 is very dramatic. Honour all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honour the king. You could scarcely think of a reading more tailor-made for a school founded in the late Victorian era, whose purpose, among other things, would have then been to turn out fine young members of the British Empire and loyal subjects of the crown. But that's not the world Peter's first readers lived in. The kings they knew were no benevolent figurehead of a democratic parliament, but the capricious and unpredictable emperors of Rome. Peter wrote, we think, in about AD 62, right in the middle of the 13 and a half year reign of the emperor Nero. Nero's first few years, I understand, went quite well, but for reasons no one seems to quite know, he then killed his mother, who'd been one of his major influences, after which, as one writer expressed it, Nero lost all sense of right and wrong and listened to flattery with total credulity. Soon after Peter wrote, there was a great fire in Rome, which some said Nero himself started so he could rebuild the city to his own tastes. Tacitus wrote that Nero accused Christians of starting the fire to remove suspicion from himself, with many Christians arrested and brutally executed by being thrown to the beasts, crucified, and being burned alive. What do we make then of Peter's assertion that these authorities are there to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right? Do we imagine that Peter might have written differently if he knew what was soon to come? Of course, it's hard to know for certain what the answer to that would be. And clearly Peter's description of authority is an idealised one. Here's how it should work. But I suspect Peter wouldn't change his mind on the importance of giving due respect to human authority because of the Old Testament insistence that the greatest rulers of the earth, and even those that act wickedly, are put in place and indeed removed as well by God himself. But also because of the example of Jesus, an example that Peter had seen at close hand. 
The final verses of our reading are full of allusion to Isaiah 53 and connecting it to the example of Christ, verse 21, who suffered unjustly at the hands of human leaders. God's will, Peter says, is that we should do good, not using freedom as a cover-up for evil, but doing good so that God is honoured. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that in recent years we've all become aware of Christian leaders who've not lived good lives, who have used freedom as a cover-up for evil and who've brought dishonour to God and his church. And if there's a lesson from all of that, then perhaps it's that it happens far more easily than we'd like to hope. So these are words to take carefully to heart. Our situation, of course, is very different to that of those under the Roman Empire in at least one respect, and that is that we get to vote. We get to participate in the processes of government. So part of honouring the emperor in our situation is going to be taking those responsibilities seriously, voting thoughtfully and prayerfully. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers Fear God, honour the emperor. Now the second example is that of household servants or slaves, among whom there were a good many early believers. It's neither a commendation of slavery nor a condemnation, but purely about how the principle of living a good life works out if that's what you happen to be. It recognises that some masters are good and considerate, in which case it's presumably quite easy to do good. But that some are harsh and unfair, as can be true generally in life. Peter's instruction is built firmly upon Jesus, who suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Again, it's worth saying that Peter saw Jesus suffering up close and was no doubt deeply affected by it coming to understand thereby that the calling of Jesus' followers was to be like him in every situation. Now, if you've been trying to read through the letter each week, as I know some have, then you'll know that the first part of chapter 3 speaks to wives and husbands. The lectionary readings skip over this part, which is unfortunate because a whole lot more of us are wives or husbands than are slaves. But of course these are touchy subjects and written to a situation that was a little different to ours. For a woman to marry, even hundreds of years ago, let alone thousands, involved significant risk. She'd leave her own family and did not know how she'd be treated, whether kindly or harshly. On top of which there was the whole question of whether she'd survive bearing children, for many didn't. And yet singleness wasn't really an option either for most, unlike the world we're used to. And so Peter speaks of wives as being the weaker partner. And yes, that will have included being physically weaker, but more so, I think, the one in the weaker position, the one with the most to lose out of entering marriage. Christian husbands, he says, must treat their wives considerately and with respect Because our wives, too, are heirs of the gracious gift of life. Wives, perhaps a little surprisingly, are to live in a way that might win their husbands to Christ if they're not believers. But again, this is simply an example of doing good in the situation you're in. And it seems to me there's a word that's especially relevant for our world and which could apply just as readily to men as to women, in verses 3 and 4. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewellery or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. We find ourselves living in a world that's become obsessed with the superficial, with clothes, with cosmetic surgery, 
and where people even risk their lives for the perfect Instagram photo. But God says it's the person inside that matters, not the external and superficial. And so that ought to be what matters for us too. Now, you may not be married, and very likely you're not a servant or slave. However, we are all citizens, and there'll be other aspects of our lives to which the principle Peter expresses applies equally well. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. I want to finish, though, by drawing your attention to verse 24 of chapter 2, where Peter speaks of Jesus in terms of Isaiah 53. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Here again, is the message of the gospel, the gracious promise of forgiveness. If we're honest, we'll know that we'll try to live good lives, but muck it up often enough. But here, in this wonderful statement, is the remarkable truth that Jesus carried our sins, yours and mine, so that we did not have to bear them ourselves the wonderful message of forgiveness for all who put their trust in him.
Let us together affirm the faith of the church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the world and for the church. God our Father, we are reminded by your word that this world is not our true home and that we live here as foreigners and exiles. Yet you called your people long ago to seek the peace and prosperity of the city into which you had carried them into exile. And so we ask your blessing on our world. Grant wisdom and integrity to all who hold offices of leadership and strengthen your people to give due honour to the human authorities which you have set in place. Lord, we long for the day when all will seek to do good and promote the welfare of others. As we continue to grapple with the impact of COVID-19, please restore our community life and limit the spread of this disease. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, strengthen and uphold your church, those you have called out of darkness into your wonderful light. We ask that your spirit will graciously use the efforts of all who proclaim and teach your word today in whatever form. Please bless our churches in Tasmania and enable them to remain faithful in spite of the restrictions on meeting and the decline in income. Keep us earnest in prayer and ever mindful of your call to make disciples of all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, giver of life and health, hear our prayers for all who are sick or suffering in any way, that by your blessing on them and those who minister to them, they may be restored to health of body and mind according to your will. Grant success to those who seek vaccines and cures for the coronavirus and protect all who give themselves to caring for others, whether as frontline medical workers or as administrators, cleaners and others whose work can be critical but unseen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you invite us to pray in Jesus' name and promise to grant our requests. We ask that our lives may indeed bring glory to you and lead others to faith in Christ. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Christ our Passover lamb has been offered for us. Therefore we come to celebrate the festival. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith with a sincere and a true heart. Merciful God, God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life, Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the risen Lord be always with you. And And also also with with you.
God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.